This is the Get A Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. Conversations. With me today, we got Cheryl, Richard, and Carmen again. Hi, everyone. Hey. So, uh, Richard, do you want to dive into some really deep stuff right away? Like the Klondike papers? I know there's people waiting to hear about these Klondike papers. Yeah, for sure. Well, the, the Klondike Papers is um, basically it's David Wallace's uh, archives for the last uh, four to five years. And by archives, I mean it's the entire contents of three or four email accounts he was running, his Twitter message feed, his Facebook message feed, his text messages on several phones. Who and is David few, Wallace? Uh, David Wallace is the private investigator um, who was hired by the Brethren to, to hunt me down. Um, and he's also, um, he's also a political operative, or, or he was, he's kind of retired now. Um, and he worked for the uh, conservative or a number of right-wing groups in Alberta in particular, basically doing dirty tricks to try and drag down and discredit um, opposing politicians and city councillors on behalf of some, some right-wing politicians there. Um, so because David was working with the kind of the right-wing politicians in Alberta, he uh, became acquainted with Gerald Shipper, or rather I should say Gerald Shipper had heard about the amazing things David could do uh, Gerald Chappell is the longtime counsel or attorney for the PBCC in Canada. He's handled a, a whole bunch of their cases. And so Gerald Chappell, um then recommended David Wallace to the Brethren as being an ideal guy to do some dirty tricks on me. Um, and they, so, were, they were hunting you... Uh, because you had document, you had dirt on them, basically. You had oh, dirt a lot on of the dirt church. On them. A lot, a of, lot dirt. of dirt on them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so Gerald Shepard um, gets in touch with David Wallace. Um, David Wallace is introduced to Rod Diplock, uh, Brad Mitchell, uh, Mick Strange. Um, who else was on the team? Uh, those are probably the main kind of characters. Uh, and this was all, amazingly enough, this was all done on, on UBT Zoom calls and UBT emails. So this isn't just, you know, Brad Mitchell pursuing a personal vendetta. This is UBT business. This is church business. Um, and the whole thing was uh, facilitated by, um, I forget her name now, a, a sister who's like a top UBT secretary, um, Suzanne Railton. Suzanne Railton, I remember. Yeah, that who's name. from down in? Yeah, she's from down in, down in the US somewhere. Originally from from Brighton, I think, in or Hastings in the UK. Uh, now, you know, they're all big names in the Brethren. Brad Mitchell was the one that's running Klondike Papers. That's kind of orchestrating, hiring someone to find you. Is that correct? Yeah, Brad Mitchell is the is the founder and president of Klondike Lubricants which is where we got the name Klondike Papers from, because a lot of his emails were from a Klondike Lubricants email address. I mean, the guy's got a whole bunch of hacks. He's using UBT emails. He's using Klondike Lubricant emails. He's using um, Ox Tools emails. And Ox Tools, of course, is Dean Hales's business, huge global brethren business. So Brad Mitchell is clearly connected right to the Hales at the top. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Brad Mitchell's refers in the Klondike papers to getting instructions from Global. Now, I don't know what Global is, whether that's a term for... I mean, there's a number of better organisations called Global. They've got a Global Organising Group, which is referenced a number of times. There's UBT Global, or Global might just be a reference to Bruce Hales because he is a kind of a globular shape, so that would be quite a good reference. And so did I read somewhere that they made the payments to David Wallace from Klondike Lubricants? Uh, no, well, was actually, it turns out they made the payments through Tilsonburg Tube, which is Keith Prince out of Tilsonburg. Um, and then they paid um, 
Daryl Shapur, or, or rather Daryl Shapur paid David Wallace through a guy called Alan Horman, who is Jason Kenny's right-hand man, where Jason Kenny is, or well, he's just finished actually, but he was the premier of Alberta for, for many years. So the payments were going through these political channels and they were being put through businesses on the other side of the continent, obviously trying to keep a kind of a firewall in the paper trail between what's obviously the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church and these kind of dirty backstreet operators who were trying to hunt me down. I mean, even, even Shepard didn't want to be associated with David Wallace. Uh, he, you know, goes through back channels to, to make the payment. Now, um, now, let me ask you this, Richard. Do you think that some of these politicians and some of these figures that are operating up at these higher levels, do you think that they know that the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church hides sexual abuse of children? Hard to say. I mean, in Australia, I think they're pretty well aware of that because there were some very, very high profile cases exposed by Michael Bachelard. But I think in Canada, it's unlikely they would understand that. I don't think there have been any very publicised Canadian cases until Cheryl came forward and you came forward. And of course, we know there's a whole lot more in the wings. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is really the point, is to make politicians aware that if they're approached by, by members of the PBCC or their businesses, uh, we are watching and we will call you out because no public servant, no one who's on the taxpayer's dollar should be having anything to do with these people. You know, I think that's the important. With a barge pole. Yeah. And I think that's important for the viewers to know of like why we're doing this and why we keep exposing this and why we're bringing up what we're going to bring up today from way back when is because the exposure people inside the PBCC need to understand what's been happening. Um, the politicians need to understand what they've gotten involved into. So the reason why we keep coming back to all this past stuff and the videos and stuff that we're going to show you today is because we need to bring it to the present so everybody can understand what's at stake here. Because if we keep on continuing, be like, okay, well, the past is the past and, you know, we're just going to leave it there. None of this truth gets excavated to be able to show the politicians, the, the church that they're involved in, and those people that are within the church need to understand what they're being hidden from that's really happening with these higher elite people that are part of the church. 100%. It, it, uh, it does. The politicians need to run from them very, very fast. But yeah. um, to get back, Richard, can you tell the listeners too, again, just to finish off that Klondike paper? how close they got to you and and and, and how close <laughs> David Wallace got and, and, and how you convinced him. Did you tell us that? Well, this is very interesting because, um, so cutting a long story short, David Wallace was hired on a very fat retainer to hunt me down. Um, David became, I mean, David is a political dirty tricks guy. And so he's out there to smear people's reputations, to dig dirt on people and put it in public for obvious political reasons. Uh, but what David isn't is he's not a murderer. He doesn't like physical violence. Um, and he, you know, he, you know, it's one thing where you've got a battle between two ugly politicians, okay? You've got a scumbag on one side, a dirty rat on the other, who cares who wins the election, right? But what, what David felt uncomfortable about is he was being hired not to kind of dig dirt on some big dirty politician. He's being hired to hunt down this guy. And of course, the first thing a private investigator does when they're given a name to find is do some background research. So David does some background research on me, find out what this Marsh guy is all about. He was told I was a criminal with a arrest warrant out for me. Because so what he finds out is I'm an ex-cult member and a whistleblower and someone who speaks out against the church. Um, and then he does some further investigation. He contacts Nathan Jacobson, who's a sort of a big, uh, you know, he's a billionaire and a sort of really international ex-Mossad um, Israeli business air, billionaire businessman. Um, well, he's not Israeli, but he was in the Israeli Defense Forces. 
uh, an old client and friend of David's. Um, anyway, Nathan Jacobson has contacts in the police. Uh, so says, ask the police, you know, you know, we've got this criminal we're looking for. What's the, what does the record say? The police say, no criminal record. The, the guy doesn't exist. He's, there's no arrest warrant for this guy. We don't find any trace of him. So Nathan Jacobson confronts Gerald Chappell with this fact. He says, look, Gerald, you've been lying to me. What are you really after this guy for? And it pretty much comes out that it's basically the brethren desperate to silence me because I've got so much dirt on them. Um, Nathan and David um, decide, look, there's absolutely no way we're going to hand this guy over to the, um, you know, to the brethren. Um, and so they then decide, you know, having dug a bit further into brethren history and what these people are like, they then decide they're going to kind of rescue me and help me to escape from this bunch. Um, <clears throat> so David phones a contact of mine, a guy called uh, Dr. Kirat Singh, who I met originally when he was a, a customer. Um, I've known him for about 15 years. He, he's an he's a excellent guy, very quietly spoken, very intellectual, Sikh uh, professor of physics. Um, and so David Wallace phones Kirat Singh and look, says, tell Richard to get out of Toronto, get out of, uh, you know, get out of the province, go and hide somewhere because these guys are fanning out. They're coming after him. And, you know, I've, I'm fearing for his life. I don't want to do this. You know, they've hired me to find him, but it's essential they don't lay hands on this guy. Kirat um, recorded this conversation. And I then sent the, uh, took the tapes and, uh, was helped by some other ex brethren to kind of turn it into a YouTube video with some background information and some images and so on. Basically, just um, most of the recording of David Wallace's phone call and some exhibits of information. Put that online, it went viral to a degree in certain circles. And then that got picked up on by City TV producer. Um, who then contacted me, which led to the whole Breaking Brethren documentary being produced. It was picked up by James De Fiore, and you know that's really how the whole present kind of movement started. And then, of course, Cheryl sees this, and she speaks to James, and you know the whole thing snowballs because basically there's such a weight of scandal and pain and trauma inside the brethren in north america that's been building up and building up it only took one small hole in the balloon for it to all start flooding out which is why the brethren are now you know trying to build a noah's ark or something to uh, escape from it so yeah so i went public with the i went public with the video um, media starts taking interest um david um got a whole load of grief from the brethren. There was like people sneaking around his house. His house was broken into. They were trying to steal his computer. They were trying to hack his computer. They were doing everything they could because the brethren realized, and the Chappell realizes, that there's a danger that, um, there's a danger that David's going to hand over all the, all his communications he'd had. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I told David from day one, I said to him, listen, David, the brethren are going to try and hack your computer, and if they fail, they're going to try and break into your house. Both those things happened inside a week of me telling him that. Uh, and then, is it even in the Klondike paper, there's, there's a, a message from Alan Hallman to David Wallace saying, the brethren want to, want to buy your old computer and they'll give you a new one. <laughs> anyway, this oh. had the opposite effect of what they intended, because... What David did, he was so furious that the brethren thought he was so stupid and so furious from them trying to break into his house and hack his computer. He said, right, well, I'm going to give you everything. I'm just going to give you everything. He's kind of an impulsive guy. You know, when he's made his mind up, when someone's annoyed him, there's no half measures. So he literally, he, he sent me his phones. I, I should have got them. I can show you. These two cracked up old cell phones. And he... he um, he gave me all the access to his email accounts, access to his Twitter account, 
everything, you know, and, and this wasn't filtered. This this also contained, you know, about 70% of it was actually his kind of personal stuff, family photos, letters to his girlfriend, um, you know. Yeah. So he, it was a huge, huge dossier of all, all kinds of information in all kinds of different formats. Fortunately, at that time, I was... I was kind of between jobs. I wasn't working full time. I had some time on my hands. So I spent two months, much to my wife's annoyance, just plowing through all this stuff. Every single email, I had to go through it all, through it all, and kind of weeding out the personal stuff, deduplicating it, um, and converting it all into PDF format. So all the emails are converted to PDFs, all the text messages are converted to PDFs. And then there was 20 or 30 long audio recordings, which were, because uh, David had a recorder on his phone, so long, long audio recordings with all these people he'd worked with. Those all had to be transcribed. That was probably the biggest part of the job, was just wow. listening to hours of audio and typing them out, turning them into PDFs. And then the beauty of PDF is you can, you can OCR it, you can make it searchable. So I assembled all of this data into one massive, uh, I think it was 6,500 page PDF and did an OCR search on it. So the whole, you know, the computer reads the whole thing and then you can type in any keyword and it'll pull up all the references. So Amazing now if work. you take the Klondike paper document and you type in Rod Diplock, it will pop up 300 references to Rod Diplock or Alan Hallman or any other name. And, and let's, let's show the listeners... Uh... That, do you have a clip for us today, Cheryl, about these guys uh, and how cl closely they related they are to uh, politics? Yeah, so we have, we do, we have the clip of Stephen Harper's acceptance speech. That's right. Now, so the listeners understand this, we're not kidding around when we say the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church have connections to high levels of government. And what we question is, do these people of the high government realize that they're connected to a terrible, terrible cult? Um, and let's let's look at how connected they are. Go on, Cheryl. Tell us uh, tell us what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is the video um, just after right at Stephen Harper's um, victory speech. So we'll just play this. It's Chuck Truen. You American. Roy Taylor. Canadian. Brad Mitchell. Canadian. Ron Barnes. And Ralph Mooney. All top members of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And what I think one of them at least was American. Yeah, yeah. Chuck Jones, Detroit, yeah. The following program is rated oh. 14 plus and contains ventral sexual sexuality <laughs> and is intended for adult audiences. You, this, you know what? We do need a disclaimer. <laughs> you know what? That actually was going straight into the break, break, the Breaking Brethren Veracity documentary is oh, what happened yeah. there. <laughs> Another good documentary. A great and document. you know, I know people have challenged, um, have taken this video to people inside and said like, hey, like, do you know about this? And the response back was they do know about it. And they've been told that those five people were there to off to let Stephen Harper know that they were there to support him and his changes he was going to make and to offer his prayers to him. <laughs> I'm like, and people are buying that. I'm like, I think it's super important for anybody who's inside, who's watching this, to be able to really wrap your mind around when you understand the Klondike papers and when we understand what happened with Richard. And then you see something like this, and then we have other stuff that we're gonna show you, but you've got to realize that five people don't need to show up at the front row of this to offer his support and prayers. And I like I wanna reiterate that over and over again, that that's that just doesn't add up. Well, and not yeah, only let, let me give you a little more. Sorry, no, no, go on, Carmen. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and you notice in that Chuck Truen is from the States. So what is Chuck Truen doing at a Canadian election event? <laughs> you know, just a really interesting fact to note there. Yeah. 
And so, I would so the say... way I came across this video is um, I was contacted by an ex-member who who wants to remain anonymous at the moment, and he was he was actually watching uh, live TV of this. Stephen Harper's um, victory speech, which was which was going on in, in a convention centre in Calgary. This is like the very night of the election. They've just finished counting the votes. This is like late at night. Um, he's watching this and, you know, the cameras panned in on Stephen Harper saying his stuff. Um, and then when Stephen Harper finishes his, his kind of the main part of his speech, he walks over to the edge of the stage and he shakes hands with these, um, with these guys. And this ex-brother was like astonished to see that there was, and it was actually zoomed in on the original video. There's Stephen Harper shaking hands with Chuck Truon, American citizen. It's the first person he shook hands with after accepting that victory nomination. The first guy he shakes hands with is Chuck Truon. Then no. he goes on. That begs the question, how much money did Chuck Truen give to be sitting in that seat? Exactly. And then Stephen Harper goes on to shake, I think, three out of the three or four out of the five. So Stephen Harper standing on the edge of the stage. These five brother members stood up. So they were kind of, you know, the stage is like waist height to them. Stephen Harper's leaning over, shaking their hands in turn. And then Stephen Harper goes back to the podium and Stephen Harper's family walks in is his wife and kids. So no, anyway, this was on public public Canadian television. And the guy then emails in within the next day or two, he emails in to CBC or whatever the Canadian broadcaster was and says, do you realize that this is actually like an American citizen he's shaking hands with and, and so on, sort of explains these are the brethren. Um, thinking that the broadcast would make some news of this and ask some questions. But no, what happens is they, when they publish the, that particular clip on their channel and on YouTube, the segment with Stephen Harper shaking his hands with the brethren is deleted out. So, in fact, if you watch that video um, on CBC now, you see Stephen Harper finish his speech. He starts walking to the edge of the stage. Then the camera cuts away to Laureen Harper and the kids walking in. When the camera gets back to Stephen Harper, he's back at the podium. So someone raised the alarm and political pressure was put on the broadcaster to take out the segment in which he's shaking hands with the brethren. And, See, and this is why I say you got to put, put your pieces together, right? They, he, they weren't just there to offer their support and prayers. No. no. And, and and do these politicians realize that these are the same guys that are so racist, their group slash little church that they belong to will not allow interracial marriage. Like that's how backwards they are. They do not believe that homosexuality is a thing. It's just a choice. They will not allow any homosexuality, any homosexuals in their entire church. Absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 and if they if you if they find that someone is, they'll try and chemically chemically castrate them with with drugs. That's a fact. There's recorded yeah. stories of them prescribing illegally prescribing medical castration drugs to people inside this church. And on one case was literally just because the person came out as homosexual. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I mean, Craig Hoyle is his name, and he's actually got, I think he's actually a documentary on him. That's yeah. Been, yeah, there's a documentary on him. Uh, and the I hope one day we can have him on the show. The Brethren doctor who administered it was uh, kicked out of the medical association. He wasn't allowed to practice because it was malpractice to misuse his uh, ability to give a prescription in that way. And you can actually find the hearing online before the Australian medical um association in which he's he admits to giving this guy these drugs and he gets kicked out yeah hmm. but i mean this is canada this is one of the wealthiest countries in the world and you do not get into the front row of the prime minister's acceptance speech i mean they didn't just turn up on the night um you know with the tim hortons in their hands say hey mind if we come in you know, this yeah. is an invitation-only event. 
And to get right on the front row. How much did you get? Yeah. Exactly. That puts you in a very, very elite class of political sponsors. Yeah. And that kind of brings us into something that else that we want to talk about and share. Um, do you want me to share that? The elections, donations that the brethren have offered and we have doc- we have. Oh that yes, is. let's let's see. So they let's remember for a second here that they do not allow their members to vote. They do not allow their members to vote. But this is what you can do. So Look this is yeah, an advertising report, election advertising report. So we're just gonna we're not gonna go through all this, and I know um, Carmen has a lot of information on this, but we're gonna just go into. Maple Creek. You better read those names out because they're, they're, they're pretty small. They're small, yeah. So um, we've got Spokoya County. I don't know who that belongs to. There's Roger Drever, Dale Boyer, Harry Drever, hey, Marion oh, Drever. I can do his voice. Hold on. Hold on. H- Harry Drever. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he has he has the he has the weirdest voice I've ever heard in my life. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's what Marion Drever, Hazel Brown, Bruce Drever, Briarside Supply Company, Morse Hope. Of course, he's on there. Um, Mile Country Laminating, Mary Boyer. That's it for Saskatchewan or for Maple Creek. Yeah, and I mean. Like, I think this is what people need to be inquiring about is like, if there is such a dead set against voting, I just don't understand how it is okay. And I know that there's been documentary of um, people inside being like, oh, we're, we can't we can't say who people are, are helping and associating themselves with politicians. And, you know, we don't have a rule that they can't um, offer them money, but what is the logistics that if you can't vote, if you are not allowed to vote, what is the difference if you're going and giving your money to certain politicians? Well, and just how many years ago, um, I remember when my little one brought home a UNICEF box from school and she asked if she could collect some money, even from around the house and put it in that box. And she went to one of the elders in Winnipeg and asked, Cause at that point we were in Winnipeg. She said, can I put some money in this box and take it back to school? And they said, absolutely not. We do not mix our money with other people's money and then give it as a contribution. <laughs> Excuse me. Is brethren money better than other people's money or why can it not be mixed? And more, is this not the same money. thing? I don't know. That is insanity. Like, I mean, this is just one little area of all of the lists of the brethren that have donated in here. This yeah. is just the Maple Creek area. Of course, there's a huge hypocrisy here because this was this was just at the same time as the brethren were campaigning against gay marriage right across Canada. Huge efforts, and they were using all kinds of fake names and the, the and using meetings. their middle names the pr- and and so on. To buy, yeah. Do you remember the prayer meetings around gay marriage? Did the oh, bill yeah, yeah. not be passed? Yeah. Huge prayer meetings asking the brothers, please pray harder, pray harder. Uh-oh, yeah. looks like it didn't work. Do they accept that it didn't work and that their prayers were not <laughs> answered and that the bill went through just fine? No, they didn't pray hard enough. We didn't donate enough money. <laughs> why, do you need, why do they need to donate money to their political causes? That is in complete contradiction of their power of prayer. I mean, if they the chosen people, one brethren prayer should be worth like ten thousand Dalai Lama prayers, right? It should be insanely powerful. But they don't even believe in the power of their own prayer, so now they got to donate yeah. money. Yeah, just to make sure it happens, you know. <clears throat> but I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge irony here because here's here's Morris Hope and Harry Drever giving large sums of money to try and prevent gay marriage because they think gay people are terribly immoral and it'll lead to a breakdown in the moral order in Canada. At the same time, they're covering up horrific cases of child abuse in their own Maple Creek congregation. 
Yeah. So how do they rationalize that in their own heads, please? There's, it, it's just there's so disheartening. Like when you sit back and look at the whole humanitarian part of this, it's just so disheartening that we have we have just a, a congregation that has this such distorted morals. And how many thousands of people are okay with this kind of happening? Let's give all this money into political parties, but yet we're not taking care of the families that are ripped apart. We're not taking care of the innocent teenagers that are thrown out onto the streets. It's just, I guess my plea is just like, you guys have got to wake up and look at the realistic black and white abuse that's happening. Oh. They can't see the forest for the trees that are right in front of them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they, How they're going to swallow this abuse pill, I just don't know. You guys, and I'm talking to brethren members in there, you guys have covered up terrible, terrible crimes for years. And we're going to keep talking and we're going to keep telling you about them until you are fucking dying for us to shut up. Uh, we're <laughs> going to bring more guests on. And we're going to hear their stories. Uh, yeah. We're going to hear about sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse. How excommunicating is is one of the evils that you um, that you promote in that church, right? This this separation that is just the ego telling you that you are better than a different than other human beings and. Mm -hmm. You know, one day, one day, if there is extraterrestrial life out there and we get visited, I will bet every dollar I have that the first words out of their mouths, if they learn how to speak English, will not be, is Bruce Hales here? <laughs> you know? There's infinite life throughout the universe. We have no idea. And it, it's just, right, the possibilities are unimaginable. And the thought that they are in these special people well, if you're special, then be special and tell the truth. You know what I mean? Like, we how many people in there know deep down they feel themselves to like something's not right about yeah. what I'm doing? Yeah. Well, we're we're the people that are telling you from the outside, you won't see any of us rush back. Okay. Um, nobody out here is gonna tell you that you're going to be rich and that crazy success, man. And I feel bad because the brethren seem to be so obsessed with money now. And the rest of the world is, is, is kind of coming to this realization that, oh, material things are not everything in life. And the brethren are so far behind the rest of society, so fucking many years back, that they're still thinking that if I get the biggest house, Jesus is going to maybe put me in the VIP section on the plane up to heaven. Like that is just their ego, just their ego. The, the irony is they're more worldly than yeah. the world is. I mean, all our lives we've been brought up the world, worldliness. You mustn't be worldly. And now they're far more worldly than your average citizen. Uh, and then take somewhere like Maple Creek. It's this very small community and it's kind of split into two. There's, the ordinary folk of Maple Creek, and then there's this exclusive little band of people who won't eat with them, won't associate with them, won't put their money in the same money box. And the reason is that that little band of people is withdrawing from iniquity. They're separating from evil, and if they broke down that wall of separation, then, you know, they might get contaminated. And then we find out that inside that little exclusive area of wonderful purity, there's pedophiles operating. The worst and the wickedest things are going on in the sacred area. It's not the ordinary folk of Maple Creek. So what sense does that kind of wall of separation make? The fact is, the wall of separation has been protecting the ordinary people of Maple Creek from the wickedness in the brethren. And I think it's important to note, too, for how many years they preached, they said, we don't vote. We don't vote. We don't have anything to do with politics. And you look at that sheet that Cheryl put up and there's 
11 people on there that have donated from Maple Creek in that particular year. That's almost 10% of their local meeting has donated in secret. And if you went in there and asked other people that aren't on that list, if the brethren participate in politics, they would almost uncertain, they would almost certainly say, we don't have anything to do with politics. So 10% of them are making donations and hiding it. You know, and amazing when you type it in, it's publicly available information. It's all out there. So they don't even stick to their own rules. You know, they bend them because the Lord takes a corner and it's so utterly convenient. But when you look at other cults, you're like, oh my goodness, they're so, they're so similar. They're so similar. They, they want to bring us back into a time where abortions are illegal, gay marriage is gone, and Bruce Hale's just, you know, everybody bows and scrapes to him. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, Putin doesn't call Bruce Hales and ask him advice, okay? <laughs> Xi, Xi Jinping does not call him. He, he, he said recently, Bruce Hales said recently that he spends the majority on, of his time on the matters of China and Russia. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna let you in on a surprising little fact. They don't think about him at all, not even a little bit. There's not one of them that thinks, what would Bruce Hales think? Because they don't know who the fuck he is because it's 50,000 people and it's a on the map. Oh. That's my rant for today. <laughs> <laughs> and they, it's, oh, it makes me, it makes me laugh. They, they had us putting up signs for, for Harper. They were, you know, pushing so hard for that bill um to not pass and it did thank goodness right yeah. and um it's just hate they don't preach any more love or or this this love and we're just simple humble christians even even bruce uh john hales right back in the day i remember when he was still the leader i was really young and hearing you know it's about being the simple humble christian right no big houses no sports cars nothing being humble and I remember being on a business meeting with my dad once and him telling this business consultant he had hired. And the consultant's like, oh, I know how to build your business into like a you know, massive business builder. And he's, my dad's like, I don't even want to become a $20 million business, you know? Now they're a $60 million <laughs> a year business. And, and it's like, well, what happened? When did the simple Christian disappear? And now it's, if you make money, then, then you're you're higher up, and now we can we can force politics. Well, we're gonna wake those politics up, those politicians up. We're gonna tell mm. them about what's actually happened. They're gonna hear Richard's story, Cheryl's story, Carmen's story, my story, and more people on here. And nobody wants to be friends with people who hide pedophiles. Which brings us on actually to um, another little clip or video, which is um, that a Canadian podcaster, in fact, the, the top Canadian podcaster and top um, independent news site in Canada called Canada Land, is uh, producing um, a, an, an excellent, an excellent new podcast, which is called Ratfucker. Um, which is basically about David Wallace, or at least it starts off being about David Wallace, and it goes on to tell parts of my story and parts of Cheryl's story, and is going to be a very, very fascinating expose of the whole PBCC. Um, and this is uh, this video is is Jesse Brown actually being interviewed by a very popular um, American. TV channel um, talking about his his new podcast, which is appropriately enough, I think it's being launched on Halloween. <laughs> so this is just the last kind of um, few minutes as he starts talking about the PBCC. I'm not going to listen to the whole thing, but we'll listen to the last few minutes of it here. In New York State, it goes on and on. He's just pouring this stuff out, and we keep asking. 
-hmm. Why? Why are you telling us this? You're not just implicating all of these people who are going to be pretty upset with you, but you're implicating yourself. And the reason he gave us is really where this story just opened up into a whole maze of new uh, plot twists. What, what he told us was that he had been hired through his conservative connections in Alberta, in Calgary, he had been connected to a fundamentalist Christian sect uh, with extensive business interests and extensive connections to politicians. And uh, this Christian sect, uh, they are called the Plymouth Brethren, they are functional in, in uh, the UK, in Australia. You can read all kinds of investigations and news stories about the Plymouth Brethren. They do have lots of connections to government. They have received millions and millions of dollars in controversial uh, COVID uh, contracts. And they do have a, a lot of political influence in circles. And uh, what David Wallace told us is that they had hired him to track down a former member of their group who had left this religious group and was... Uh, basically turned into a whistleblower and that when he succeeded in finding this guy, Wallace became very suspicious about what was going to be done with this guy. And what he claims is he had essentially a crisis of conscience that he got to the crossroads and was uh, increasingly suspicious that this was not your typical dirty tricks job, that this might be moving into uh, darker territory, and he felt he might be personally implicated. He might be getting set up for liability. And he also claims that he was very concerned about what was going to happen to this ex-member of this fundamentalist Christian group. So a lot of our work in the series is investigating those claims and saying, is, is, it, is it accurate that David Wallace finally found his conscience or are there other motivations driving him? Okay, and real quick, uh, Klondike papers, what are they? Well, the Klondike papers, really, we wouldn't have pursued this or been able to confirm any of this without them. These are David Wallace's files. These are 6,400 pages of emails and text messages and metadata. And it's just astonishing to go through this and to see that the, the types of people he was communicating with. He was communicating with some fairly high level political figures, not just in Canada, but around the world. And it's often very difficult to get the context of what he's talking about. There's a lot of uses of aliases, but really it was this treasure trove of tips. And our job was to, first of all, is this doctored? Are these documents fraudulent? Uh, can we verify that they're real? And then if they are real, what are the stories that they tell? Now, we were doing our work, which is slow, methodical work of journalism, uh, picking specific stories that spans years and trying to report them out and getting people to verify them. Meanwhile, there was uh, rumor and word of these Klondike papers spilled onto the internet. And a hashtag, Klondike papers, hit millions of people in Canada very quickly. A lot of people were commenting on the Klondike papers who had never seen them or read them. And I think it's safe to say that it became something of a conspiracy theory. And people were jumping to a lot of conclusions and making the darkest inferences and conclusions uh, from these papers without really knowing whether they're true or not. All right, fine. You win. We got to watch it or listen to it. Uh, it's a super interesting story. Uh, the podcasting network is Canada Land. That's where you can find it. You can find it, of course, anywhere where there's podcasts. And this particular podcast is called Rad Effort, the actual thing, uh, Confessions of a Dirty Tricks Operative. All right, Jesse Brown, thank you so much for joining us. Wow. Yeah, that's going to be a very, very good podcast um i know when i had when i when i did my interview with them it was very lengthy and very in-depth um yeah they were really combing through everything it's going to be very good when it comes out and i think it's just super important that we keep exposing this stuff over and over and it's not that we keep rehashing stuff it's it has to be exposed until accountability happens. And I sat with myself um, last night with the, the whole, the whole word accountability, what does accountability mean? Right. I mean, we could do a whole separate podcast just on that because my version of accountability seems to be very different than the PPCC. And I think that those of us that are victims of the PPCC need to have our level of accountability and our definition of accountability 
vocalized over and over and over until the PBCC understand what accountability really means. Accountability has to happen. This is, again, reiterate, it is not about retaliation. This is not about us not letting the past go. Believe me, I let that past go. When I left Medicine Hat, um, first lived in Maple Creek, then moved to Medicine Hat, left Medicine Hat, left that world behind me. I never kept in any contact with any of you. I never kept in contact with any ex-members other than a few of them. I did. I re- I rebuilt my life. It's learning how to be responsible um, and to stop enabling what's happening. Because every one of us that stays quiet, that keeps this stuff stuffed and doesn't allow um, themselves to rehash the past because it hurts too much, you're enabling them. And I know that sounds harsh coming out of my mouth, but it truly is that. Those that keep quiet enable this power to get larger and larger and larger. When I left, right, yes, I had gone through a horrific, horrific deal, but it has grown politically and financially so strong because so many people have stayed quiet. If we can get this movement growing and we have to keep exposing the past, we have to keep exposing what's happened. Otherwise, that accountability is not going to happen. And they just keep on growing bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, we're now dealing with multi-billionaires that they just dish out their money wherever it's needed. And we know we live in a world where money buys you things, right? I mean, there's, (laughs) there's no denying that. But at some point, if enough of us speak our truth, bring our story forward and hold them accountability. Hopefully morals overrule all the money of the world. That's what has to happen. Holocaust survivor put it unforgettably. He, He said that all it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to keep silent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I got a funny story, you know, something funny and light for the ending. Um, I'm six, seven years old, driving home from church, middle of winter in Montreal, and my uncle, Gord McKinnon, is driving in the vehicle, and we're in his truck, and it's, I think it was a Ford, old Ford F-150, two-wheel drive. Because why? Because Gord McKinnon had once heard, uh, I think, Taylor... JT Taylor or something, say something about four-wheel drives were worldly. So he thought absolutely no four-wheel drives were allowed in the Brethren. Now in front of me was my dad in a pickup truck that had four-wheel drive. And we came racing up. My dad was driving a lot faster to a stoplight. And my dad slammed on the brakes and kind of slid into the intersection a little bit, but it was clear. And then he just takes off. And my uncle just laughs and goes, see, <laughs> four-wheel drive doesn't help you stop. You know, and I was like, hmm. and then we tried to leave the intersection and it took us 10 minutes because the wheels were just spinning and spinning <laughs> and spinning. But I remember thinking, I said, what was wrong? What's wrong with four wheel drive? You know, Uncle Gord. And he's yeah. like, he tells me. And I remember all the way home trying to think power goes to two wheels. Jesus, it's OK. Power goes to four <laughs> wheels. Jesus, not OK. You know, <laughs> you know, just like as a kid, just trying to figure out like how many wheels, why does four wheels make Jesus mad, but two wheels makes him happy. <laughs> and now they all drive Range drivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Jesus turned the corner again. He's so, he turns so fast. He's going in circles. <laughs> it's called uh, donuts, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else should we cover today? We want people to come on, you know. Um, let's line up some guests and we're going to get into some stories about how it was leaving. The nights we left, you know, build up, what it was like a couple days after leaving, you know. How about that? Yeah, I think it's good. I know. Yeah, mine was hilarious leaving. It was, I remember me and Sarah were, (laughs) 
we left home and I had my um, contact solution stuffed inside my grad coat and all my clothes had been pushed out the window the night before, picked up by a cousin who was drunk and left them beside his truck and drove away. So I never, ever got my clothes. And <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we like it, we spent our first night on a floor of an apartment building and at what, 13 years old? No, I was 17. She was, she was younger. She was 15. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was 17, but it was, it was, do you know, there's just so much that leads up to that leaving that decision and the planning that you, you have. And I mean, I left with like $300 thinking I was going to be able to take some time off and you're just not prepared for, for what happens when you meet that real world. And realize, well, that $300 is not going very far because rent was $300. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I think it's important that we all get out and start telling our stories. And I just want to kind of go over some resources that um, we list at the end of our podcast. And so everybody can get a hold of us on info.getalife at proton.me. Um, we have a YouTube channel um, that's Get a Life. We have uh documentaries that are very very important to watch the if nobody's watched the veracity breaking brethren one that's a super good one that's just been recently out um lane had one done back in 2015 was it called the devil's trap very very good documentary that kind of shows what it's like when you first leave and the emotional roller coaster and the party and and you know that going back home and then kind of succumbing to the tracks being handed out and it was, it had me in tears. Um, there's also some really good books. There's Behind the Exclusive Brethren by Michael Bachelor. It's a very excellent book. And podcasts. So James D. Fiore was the very kind soul who opened up the can of worms for us here in Canada. Um, we want to very much thank him for him taking the Band-Aid off and allowing so many of us to come forward and tell our stories. So check out his um, Black Bald podcast. And then there's also all the lists of all the podcasts. If you Google on YouTube, PBCC podcast, you'll get the list of all of the podcasts that have been done. And it's also important, we offer the Mental Health Support Canada uh, helpline there to for anyone that's struggling to make sure you reach out. Um, and hopefully we can see some of you on here and start this movement going via this podcast and maybe get some healing in another layer. That's our hope. And Anything else you guys healing, want to add? If your healing involves rock and roll, then rock on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think that ends it for today and we will catch you guys next time. Take care, everyone. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me.